on Abraham Lincoln and the inside story of the Gettysburg Address. But let me first introduce myself. I'm Sandy Quinn. I'm president of the Richard Nixon Foundation. I welcome all of you here today. Um, I want to ask how many of you are members of our associates club? Look at this, how embarrassing. <laughs> did, you, did you raise your hand? Did you? Please stand. Please give them an applause. Anybody who's a member, please stand. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, now, I know you're embarrassed if you're not, and, but there's a remedy for that. So when you leave, you can get from the desk out in the lobby an attractive four-color brochure that will tell you how to join, which you can do from $50 to $5,000. But what it does for you is it gives you advance notice of our events, it gives you discounts at all our events, it gives you free admission, and it gives you a discount on everything in our museum store. So you get the money back, and you're supporting our efforts to preserve and communicate the legacy of the 37th president. So please consider joining. Some of the events that you'll be able to attend if you do join are, uh, and by the way, the flyer that we handed out on the on April 1 is the Cambodian New Year celebration, and I think it was wrong in some of your uh, flyers. So it is April 1, it is not tonight. On March 9th, we have two-time Secretary of Defense Don Rumsfeld coming for his new book, Known and Unknown. He'll speak from this stage on the 9th, and he'll autograph his book. On April 1, at 2 o'clock on this stage, we have, for his ninth bestseller, Dick Morris coming. And throughout the summer, and I hope all of you who have kids and grandkids will check our website, nixonfoundation.org, and find the six dates that we present meet the presidents and we gather in this room it's free at 10 30 on six different days mainly tuesdays and it's summertime starts june 28th with george washington and each of the presidents washington uh, even president nixon uh, through his brother ed uh, lincoln jefferson roosevelt even pat nixon uh, present their life and legacy and the kids all gather and sit on the floor we have uh, coloring we have uh, we have uh, punch and cookies I think that's why everybody comes but you also get to meet you also get to meet and hear the presence which you will do again today at two o'clock when on this stage we'll have a Mount Rushmore of presidents the ones you saw in the lobby but here you'll have an opportunity to hear them talk about how they treated um, issues that came before them dealing with America's place in the world. And then you can ask questions. So please come back at 2 o'clock for our, our program uh, with the presidents. Now, our speaker today has been here many times and always gets crowds like this. He's written about 35 books. I can't keep track of them all. He was speechwriter to five presidents. He's an attorney, graduate of George Washington University. He was director of policy and planning for the United States Department of State. He worked with President Nixon. He's taught at the University of Pennsylvania the University of Southern California, the University of Colorado. He's taught and lectured all over the world. He's an authority, not only on President Lincoln and a number of other presidents, but on Winston Churchill. In fact, when you meet him here in a moment, you'll know that he can impersonate Winston Churchill very, very well. Ladies and gentlemen, the good friend of the Nixon family, a good friend of the Nixon Foundation, and of mine, may I present James Humes. Thank you, Sandy. No 
notice the red socks. Gettysburg stinks. At least it did in early August 1863 when 10,000 bodies lay putrefying on the field. Now sure, some 100 or so volunteers from the town went out and attempted the grisly task of cleaning, sorting, tagging, and carting the bodies to the depot to be shipped to Massachusetts, Michigan, and other states. But soon, they were daunted by the enormity of it all and quit. But they turned to their congressman, and he said, look, make it a national cemetery. And then the Union soldiers have to do the cleanup job. And that's what happened. Well, in the middle of the 19th century, dedicating a cemetery in a town was a sacred ritual. And so they invited the greatest order in the nation to give the talk. And that was not Lincoln. It was the man who wrote the book on oratory, Edward Everett. And Edward Everett, who had been president of Harvard and chairman of rhetoric at Harvard, he looked like a president, not awkward and gawky like Lincoln, but stately, and he had silver hair and a baritone voice to match. Not only did he look like a president, he was more qualified than Lincoln to be president. He had been congressman, governor, secretary of state, ambassador to Britain, and even a candidate for vice president in 1860 on the Constitution ticket. So they write Edward Everett. And so on. This is in late August. And Everett writes back, the first day I'm free is November 19th. Oh, he was a busy man. He made in that day equivalent of a half million dollars a year on lecture fees. And his baritone voice had been heard in halls from New York to Chicago or Boston to St. Louis. Now, about the time of early October, they wanted to invite the VIPs, mayors of adjoining towns, congressmen in Pennsylvania. And someone said, well, should we invite the president? And they said, no, he'll just come and give some funny jokes. We can't have that. And they say, well, one said, I know that Lincoln never ventures out of Washington, DC. So we'll invite him with the intended publicity, and he won't come. But to their chagrin, he accepted. Now, they went to Andrew Curtin, governor of Pennsylvania, and a political friend of Lincoln. Incidentally, he was in the law firm of Humes and Curtin. Uh, his great, my great-great-grandfather was his partner. And that's how I know this story. Curtin goes down to feet to see Lincoln at the executive mansion now, of course, called the White House. And he said, well, look, I know it's... Uh, Absurd, but those people back there, 
they think you know, you'd uh, you know, tell jokes or something. And Lincoln nodded. And he said, now, uh, I'm, I'm telling you, it's a solemn occasion. I'll keep it short and solemn. Now, Lincoln had always planned to give a speech on the Declaration of Independence. On Gettysburg, which was July 4th, remember, the celebration for victory extended to the 5th, the next day. And a lantern procession came to the White House begging Lincoln to speak. And Lincoln stands on the balcony and says, well, what is it, 80 odd years that our fathers wrote those words, all men are created equal. That's a worthy subject, but I uh, can't do justice to it today. Well, Lincoln knew that he couldn't deliver the folksy kind of speeches which had won him legal fame in Illinois because he would represent farmers who had their cows mowed down by trains and he'd tell his, in his folksy way and he'd win big settlements so the railroad said, wait a second, we can't have this. And they hired him at 50000 a year to be their lawyer, which was pretty big money in 1850. So he needed some stately words. You know, the kind of word that, like a golden sovereign, he said, that when you throw in the collection plate, it rings. So where do you find those stately language, the majestic language in the King James Version of the Bible? Because there may be stately words, but everyone knows them because they read the scripture every day and hear it on Sunday. So that is why Lincoln began, we used the phrase, four score and seven years ago. Because in Leviticus, it says three score years and ten, and everyone knows that. It's the human span of life. And Lincoln wanted to show that democracy is a very fragile flower, and we have now gone beyond the human span. Then he said, brought forth a nation. By the way, it's the first time our president ever used the word nation. Before that was union. Brought forth a nation. Now you don't say, oh my sister brought forth a child last week, do you? But that's in Matthew. And then they used from Genesis, conceived in liberty. In Genesis it says conceived in bondage because Hagar was born from that. So he says conceived, pause, in liberty. Then he uses the word from his favorite Biblical verse, Proverbs 29, chapter 19. And it is where there is no vision, the people perish. Now, you don't say your grandmother perished last week of a stroke, do you? But he used those majestic words. Now on November 18th, remember November 19th is the day, he's 
getting ready to board the train to Gettysburg. And Mary Todd Lincoln comes in and throws herself at the knee. Hey, please, I don't go to Gettysburg. Our boy Tad will die. Your boy Tad had a temperature of a hundred and one. Now, Willie had died the year before, and Edward, their oldest, had died in 1850. And President Lincoln said, now, mother, now, mother, everything will be all right. So Lincoln, with heavy heart, took the train, you know, by the crow flies, it's only about 50 miles from Washington to Gettysburg to the north, but they went for security reasons. They went east to Baltimore, north to Hanover, Pennsylvania, and then west to Gettysburg, which took about three hours. Now, Lincoln had stationed in the first compartments the ward, who was going to be the ward, uh, the ward marshal of the day, his uh, friend who lived in the White House from Illinois, Ward Hill Lamont. Now, he was known for his collection of body songs, which he would play on his banjo. And he kept the people from Lincoln by entertaining them with a lot of whiskey, too. Lincoln sat in the back. Now, people said, well, I saw the president. You know, he was writing his speech on an envelope. No. He had written already six drafts in the executive mansion. On a pencil, six drafts. What he was doing on the train was writing keywords in order, a memory device to, so that he could deliver the speech from memory. Now he arrives at Gettysburg and they take him to the Willis house Lincoln doesn't touch the food, doesn't speak. He's worried about his boy. And Edward Everett is there, and a French admiral, and other dignitaries. Lincoln goes up to bed, and he prays for his boy. And he, when he finishes the prayer, the Union soldier, Lincoln was popular, particularly with the enlisted men. Lincoln was not popular at that time. He was rather unpopular. But the people who did like him were the fighting men. Not so much the officers, the enlisted men. And they serenaded him with their favorite hymn, and Lincoln loved it. We are coming, Father Abraham. And that was their nickname for him. And when they'd finished it, the captain gave a telegram and went upstairs. And Lincoln learned that the fever had broken. And so he went to sleep. Soundly. The next day, Edward Everett and Lincoln ride out to the review stand. Everett began his speech, looking up at the blue sky. Beneath these cerulean skies. And then in a theatrical masterpiece, replete with gestures and flourishes, he begins with the with the uh, 
buried, the rituals of burial in ancient Athens, moves on to the retelling of the, all the battles that led up to those days on July 3rd. And he closes them with Gettysburg. It was wrought like marble, like a classical statue, and just as cold. But the audience that came, about 10,000 from everywhere, they had gotten their money's worth. He was the top performer in the union at that time. And then Ward Hill Lamone said, the president of the United States of America. Now Lincoln, he took off his stovepipe hat. That was his briefcase. He had all his papers and addresses, <laughs> including his speech. And he has steel glasses. He really doesn't use them. He never looks down at the text. And Lincoln is more nervous than he expected. He certainly delivered his speech in more without deliberation, which he had wanted to do because he, he was nervous. He would ad lib in one place under God, and his voice would break, would break with emotion towards the very end. Lois Gorin, seven years ago, our fathers brought forth upon this continent a new nation conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Now we are engaged in a great civil war testing whether that nation or any nation so conceived, so dedicated, can long endure. We are met on a great battlefield of that war. We have come to dedicate a portion of that field as a final resting place for those who gave their lives that this nation might live. It is altogether fitting and proper that we should do this. But the brave men, living and dead, who fought here have consecrated it far beyond our poor power to add or detract. It is rather for us, the living, to be dedicated to the unfinished work which those who fought here have thus far so nobly advanced. It is rather for us to be dedicated to the great task remaining before us, that from these honored dead we take increase devotion to the cause for which they gave their last measure of devotion. That we here highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain. And that this nation under God will have a new birth of freedom. And the government of the people by the people and for the people shall not perish from the earth. There was no applause. The, it was so short, two minutes, that the people felt they were listening to a prayer, not a public speech. I, I think sort of thought he had failed. But in a sense, the brevity of the speech enhanced its beauty and enabled 
countless millions all over the world to memorize it. The most memorized speech in history. In China, they memorized in English. So did they in France and Germany. But it would take the surrender at Appomattox, the freeing of a million slaves in households, and a, an assassin shot in a theater. Make the words that Lincoln uttered eternal. When, before the Gettysburg Address, the 4th of July was a nationalistic holiday. Liberation from Britain. But after the Gettysburg Address, it took an international dimension. The liberation of humanity. Before the Gettysburg Address, the Declaration of Independence, few of them knew of the words Americans. It was the Constitution that people called, and the Constitution says. But Lincoln, in a sense, would take Jefferson and put him on Mount Rushmore because he grafted the Declaration of Independence to the Constitution. So much so in the 1880s, it was as if the Statue of Liberty, that you could see that Statue of Liberty with a neon sign under it flashing. All men are created equal. All men are created equal. All men are created equal. And millions seeking freedom and opportunity came from Europe, from Asia, to realize that freedom. There's one other thing I forgot to mention to you. Lincoln only had three years of education. His father would often beat him for trying to read. His stepmother brought a lot of books and encouraged him. And the book that he read the most was a book he had to borrow, The Life of General Washington. And he bought it from a fellow congregant in the Methodist Church. And he would read that book every night by candlelight in his loft. And one morning in 1823, in April, he woke up devastated because that book had been totally destroyed by the spring rain that seeped through the log and ruined the book. And so he had to pull stumps out of a pasture to pay for the book. Now, this was his only possession he had, this ruined book. But there was one page still legible the page underneath, the last page, protected by the elements. And it was a woodcut showing General Washington on his knees before a memorial marked Valley Forge. And under the woodcut were eight words. These dead 
shall not have died in vain. And those words etched and engraved themselves on his heart permanently. And Forty years later, he would go to that field in Gettysburg and repeat those words. Words that would make the Gettysburg Address what Carl Sandburg said, the great American poem. Ladies and gentlemen, um, Mr. Humes has agreed to answer questions. If you have any, if you would raise your hand, I'll bring the microphone to you, and you can stand up and, and ask him. Do I see any? Anybody? Yes, right? over there in the red shirt. Where? Right here. All right. What well, I did this? one for Eisenhower. It doesn't count. Uh, Nixon, uh, two years in State Department. Ford, I helped Ford write his memoirs and gave him the title, Time to Heal. And on contract for uh, uh, Reagan and Bush Sr. And I'll tell you, the brightest president I ever worked for was Richard Nixon. <laughs> he used to have a saying that Reagan would edit you for style, Nixon for substance, and uh, Bush and uh, Bush Sr. and Ford never touched a word. Uh, I have heard, and I wondered if you could validate that the previous speaker, Everett, uh, wrote Lincoln a couple of days afterwards. Yeah, and commented Lincoln, that yes. it was one of the greatest speeches he ever heard, and could he have a handwritten copy of it? And that that copy still lives today, that Lincoln gave to Everett? Is that uh, fundamentally true? You mean, which speech does he consider the greatest speech? Uh, I guess the speech by Lincoln, but Everett asked for a copy. Oh, Everett did ask, and he had a change that he had to add uh, under God. Uh, many people consider the uh, second inaugural the greatest speech, too. But those are his two greatest speeches. Some other questions. Do the children have a question? Oh, here, right here. Do you know which draft Lincoln actually used for his speech? He used the sixth draft. The final draft. Does that answer it? What does fever broke mean? What? What does the fever broke mean? Oh, the fever uh, ended. You know, when you had were sick when you were little and your mother was called the doctor and you had a fever of 101, she was very alarmed. And then when she would come the next day, maybe, and was back to 98, she'd be happy. That's what it means. Is it true that uh, there was 195 words in the Gettysburg Address and that 165 of them were one syllable? Would you care to comment on that? Lincoln, like Churchill, never used the passive voice, and he liked um, short words Anglo-Saxon words, not Latinate words. But uh, Ch Churchill would use, you know, these sort of not only, but also, or these adverbial beginnings, not the first time that, and Lincoln avoided that. Right yes? I would like to know if you have a preference. At this particular moment in your life, you've known all these wonderful presidents. 
would you, do you have a, a particular president that you would have loved to have written for? Present, past, I don't know. Is there a first, is there a particular president I have a special affection for? A particular president you wish you had had the opportunity well, to Well, Lincoln write. didn't have a speechwriter. I'd love to have written for him. Neither did Theodore Roosevelt. I'd love to have written for him. Uh, so I don't know. That's a good question, and I'd have to um, think about it right now on which president. Yes? Well, if you call the book, which we unfortunately don't have today, it's called Wit and Wisdom of Lincoln by Beckon, uh, Beckon Publishing, and there's a leather, it's a leather-bound book, and uh, if you uh, order it and can't get it, um, the library will give you my name, and I'll get it for you and autograph it for you. Uh, well, the most interesting presentation I made of this was I was invited to Canterbury Cathedral and delivered this on the 4th of July in 1996. And I've delivered it as a sermon, too, because the way he used the Bible for inspiration and for its majestic language. If a young person wanted to become, if a young person wanted to become a presidential speech writer, what would you advise them to do? Major in English, not journalism. With all the unrest going on in the Middle East at this time, what are your views for all these people fighting for democracy there? Well, I think that the words of Lincoln and the Gettysburg Address still beckon us. And that's why America has to remember that role. There's still, in a sense, you can see beneath the Statue of Liberty that neon sign. It doesn't take too much imagination to see that sign blinking off and on. All men are created equal. And that message still resonates throughout the world. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in thanking Jamie Humes for his great presentation. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we know that our speakers come not for the lavish honorariums we pay them. <laughs> or the international attention they get for being here, but for our one-of-a-kind, limited edition, custom-made gifts. This one, What Would Nixon Do?, is coincidentally available in our gift shop, but <laughs> which you could purchase right now, along with your membership. So we're presenting it to Jamie in hopes that he'll come back. Also, he has a number of books that we have in our gift shop, so we're going to persuade him to go to the, the museum store right now where you can 
select uh, one of several of his books. Also, the book that was just republished, uh, The Wit and Wisdom of Abraham Lincoln. If you watch our website, we'll have it available on there very, very soon, as soon as it's delivered. Uh, be back here at 2 o'clock and hear our Mount Rushmore of presidents on this stage. Thank you for coming. Please meet Jamie in a few minutes in the museum store.